And we are live. Welcome to another episode of China, Hawaii, and you. I am your host, Andrew Zimmerman. We'd like to say aloha and welcome back to our series on climbing the Great Wall of Chinese. This is going to be the first episode that I have ever done where it's going to be a solo show. And most of our shows up to this point, have, and all of our shows have been interviews, uh, where we kind of get at somebody's uh, get at somebody's experience, pick at their brains, try to learn something. But today, I'm really excited to tell you that I'm going to be taking the show on my own and sharing some of what I've learned about Mandarin Chinese. We're getting really excited to show you um, the presentation that I've gotten together, and I'm going to kind of introduce you to some principles that I wish somebody told me before I started. So. Um, if we could get the presentation open, please. All right. So we, I've titled this a rocket ship lesson on Chinese. Um, and you'll notice here uh, on the side, uh, it's, the name is by Andrew Zimmerman, and my Chinese name is An Yi Shan. It means quiet memories of the mountain. I tend to really like that name. Next slide, please. Okay. So my name is Andrew Zimmerman, as you probably know. I am bilingual in Chinese and English. I achieved this in the span of about two years. I had some interest in it in passing before that, but uh, when I first got to China, I could barely get myself some noodles. <laughs> but uh, you know, by the end of it, I was. Uh, I remember at the end of it, I was explaining to people in taxis why Biden pulled U.S. troops out of Afghanistan, all in Chinese. <laughs> so very, very complicated topics I was able to do. Uh, and I did this all through immersion. And we will talk about immersion learning a little bit. Um, but I think it's a really, really valuable thing. And I think it's even more valuable than, in some cases, talking to people in real life. So let's go to the next slide, please. All right. So I have a couple of disclaimers before we start. I cannot make any promises on timeline. So I did it in two years. I can tell you that. I can't tell you how long it'll take you. It's going to depend on your availability, your maybe previous experience, or maybe you had some childhood experience with Chinese growing up. Um, you know, some people believe that when you're older, that slows down the language acquisition device. Personally, I don't actually believe that... Um, older adults are at significant disadvantages in language acquisition. And I'll talk about that more a little bit too. Um, but I think that you should definitely uh, pursue it regardless of your age. Um, but the other side of that coin is that I have nothing to sell you. All right, I'm gonna make, make that very, very clear. I do not have a product. Uh, I'm only here because I believe that Chinese is a really valuable skill and I want people to pursue it uh, to the largest of the ability. Can we pull the slide up one more time? All right. And I want to make one more disclaimer, which is um, I cannot sell you on Chinese. And what I mean by that is um, there's a lot of people that will talk about why you should learn Chinese. And we've given we've talked about some of those already. Right. It's a great emerging market. It's, uh, it, you know, largest number of native speakers in the world, depending on how you measure it. Um, you know, there's tons of places that you can go. There's Chinese people all over earth, the earth. Right. There's a lot of things that you can do. But at the end of the day, I'm not really interested in selling somebody on why they should learn language X, language Y. And the reason that I say that is because Learning any language requires an extremely high amount of self-discipline and focus onto this thing for a span of years, right? And so I'm cautious to try to sort of influence somebody's dreams from the external side, because I think for any amount of success in Chinese, you need to have at least some kind of internal motivation. So I don't really want to make necessarily make it my job to try to do that. Um, having said that, we'll move on to slide number three. All right. So the purpose of today is I cannot teach you. I want you everybody to know I cannot teach you Mandarin in half an hour. Um, I would be wonderful if I could. <laughs> I would probably make a lot of money, but, um, but we're not going to do that today. What I can tell you is I can tell you really important principles on how to learn it. In other words, this is going to be a presentation that's centered around what I wish somebody told me when I first started. I have taken very, very few formal Chinese education classes. Uh, most of it was just watching YouTube videos and uh, babbling what I could into in, in you know menus, uh, like trying to read off of a off a restaurant menu. Maybe talk to a taxi driver or a massage lady. Um, you know, 
most of these things um, were really organic in this way. And there were a lot of embarrassing moments that I think I've talked about before, but um, you know, I have very minimal um, formal education, but the good news is I don't think that you need it. And we're gonna talk about why in a minute. So let's get through these principles first and then we'll talk about how to do immersion learning. Next slide, please. Okay, so first and foremost, the very first thing that a lot of people think about when they think of Chinese is getting through characters. Chinese is well known for having something like 80,000 recognized characters. It depends on what scholar you ask, but these can be really, really intimidating. And it's easy to wonder to yourself, how on earth am I supposed to learn these? The answer, as I say in here, is one bite at a time. And be patient with yourself, you will get there. I have books in my house that are entirely in Chinese. I'd love to show you all sometime. Um, but the good news is every single Chinese character has a corresponding uh, what's called opinion pronunciation. So it's basically just how you would pronounce it here. I don't know if uh, people can see the, uh, if we could, could we pull up the slide one more time. Um, you can see in this, this is the dictionary app that I use called Pleco. On the top, I have a sentence, 我的朋友, it means my friend. 我 means I, it's the first character. 我的 means like a possessive usually. Uh, and then 朋友 means your friend. You can see all this on the right side. This is my favorite dictionary app, as I said, but you can see that all of the characters have very, very easy, easily pronounceable um, pinyin equivalents. And so in this way, it makes getting characters relatively easy. Next slide, please. Now, the other piece of good news, that actually means that writing is really easy. Software can usually guess the correct character that you're trying to do. Very occasionally, you'll need to search through a sea of characters that have the same pinyin spelling, but usually that's not such a big deal. Remember, if you have any doubts about what your correct character is, you can always check a dictionary before sending a message. There's nothing wrong with that. And even if you make the wrong character, maybe someone will get what you're trying to say anyway. The last thing I want to mention is that uh, very occasionally you will not know what the um, what the correct opinion is to look up a character, right? And so you'll have to manually draw that. And fortunately, these apps have uh, drawing features so you can draw a character easily from a TV show. Next slide, please. Okay, I want to talk about one or two very important misconceptions before we really kick it off. As I've said here, often we'll hear that learning like people should learn languages just like a child does. And this is because in our culture, we have a common belief that children naturally have some kind of linguistic superiority when it comes to language acquisition. And this is not true. There's a categorical difference in how adults learn languages and how children learn languages. And we wanna kind of utilize the strengths that we have while trying to get around the weaknesses. The biggest reason that we shouldn't try to learn languages like children is because we're not children. We're smarter than them. Under the right circumstances, researchers have consistently found that adults are better language learners than children. The other factor is that we have significantly less time than children. Children, when they're, you know, from, let's say, zero to five, all they have to do, their only job is to, uh, you know, learn a couple words of their whatever their native language is so they can communicate with their parents. This is, um, in, this is not something that we have in modern society. Um, overwhelmingly, people have to work, people have family obligations. And so we need to be a little bit more precise in how we spend our time. We can't just expect 10,000 hours of Chinese will get it for us. The third reason why I think that it's important to split this is because we already have an English map of the world. In other words, you already in your mind have some rough map of how you understand the world. And you have used the English language to map that understanding into something that you can, into words that you can say, right? And so the thing is, children do not have an internal map of the world. Um, you know, children probably don't even understand the concept of like gravity, right? There's, there's some, some very simple things that adults can articulate why things happen. Children have no idea, right? They're still articulating, they're still figuring out um, what kind of situations will make them Will make them learn or make them develop or even get some basic physiological needs met. And so what we should do is we should use this already existing map of the world that we have in English 
and use it to map on uh, to our target language. The last thing that reason that I want to kind of separate how children and adults learn in um, Chinese is because children, when they're learning Chinese, have the advantage of they're already fluent in Mandarin, and therefore, when it comes to writing, you know, everybody always wonders, oh, how can you learn to write three, four, five thousand characters? The thing is, it's actually not that difficult for them because mentally they already have associations of what every character should be. And so I would submit to you, if you took all of the English language and when it was spoken, it was still the same, but you began replacing words so, so they were not necessarily phonetic, but they were replaced by a symbol. It's actually not going to be as hard as you think it is because you already, as I said, you already have this mental association of what English is. And, and so if something were to happen such that the spelling of words were changed or, you know, we replaced it with symbols, I don't think it would actually be very difficult for people to adapt to it at a time. Next slide. Okay. Uh, and there's one other thing that I want to talk about. So now that we've talked about opinion, which is wonderful for Chinese learners um, because, you know, it makes all of these characters comprehensible. It's very tempting to rely on opinion entirely and to skip learning all these thousands of characters. I understand completely that these characters are very, very daunting. People don't want to do it. But there's a really big problem with this approach, which is basically how are you going to reinforce what you know? Now, if you live in the United States, I know we live in Hawaii, but if you live in the United States, um, your point of contact with our people around you, right? In other words, the people that you normally communicate with are overwhelmingly not going to speak Mandarin Chinese, right? You can take a sort of communicative approach. These, are, these things have been tried by the military before, where instead of you know, having people read books and watch movies or something, they just talk. And they talk, 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 and they would acquire words this way. Um, the reason I don't like this approach is because I think it's not sustainable for the vast majority of people because your point of contact through a foreign language most of the time is going to have to be some kind of media form. And the reason it's going to have to be a media form is because a media form is something that is consistent. You know, all you have to do is you have to load up Netflix or you have to open your foreign language book. And there it is. There's your foreign language stuff, right? Whereas if you want to talk to somebody that speaks Japanese or Chinese, right, that's probably not in your house. So there's a good chance that you would need to go to maybe a restaurant, maybe you need to go to some kind of cultural center, maybe you would even need to hire a tutor, right? But if you want to have uh, content, if you want to have, you know, just some kind of experience with your target language, um, be it movies, books, magazines, what have you, these things are very, very accessible, right? And I think that they're really, really good. But here's the thing. Um, when it comes to keeping Chinese fresh or keeping your target language fresh and continuously reminding yourself of what these words are, right? Because you have to remember, language learning is all about learning and forgetting the words. I have forgotten words in Chinese hundreds of times, right? And I'll look it up and maybe the time to go and I forget it. And then I look it up again and I forget it. But the thing is, and this is my advantage, when you learn something the second time, it tends to stick a lot tighter than it did the first time. And the reason that's so is because your brain is a, a really interconnected web of memories, right? People tend to think of your brain that memories is like a filing cabinet, but really your brain is your brain's memories are all about association. So one technique that people will often use when they're trying to remember things is they'll try to connect it to something that they already know or they'll maybe connect it to an experience they were having um, during the time that they learned that thing, right? These, these, these wet, this web of memories is very, very uh, hard to understand in some ways, but by making these mental connections with the characters uh, and sort of seeing them on TV, you know, in books, whatever, uh, you are much more equipped to have better recognition of these characters. And so you have to accept that you're going to forget and relearn words a lot of the time. And the way to make that sustainable is with media content. It's not with talking to people, at least not at first. I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not, to be clear, I'm not 
opposed to talking to people. I just often think, especially in the beginning stage, it's not really the most effective way. Next slide. Okay, so next principle, tonals. We've talked about um, opinion. We're going to talk about tones. Chinese is a tonal language. There's four main tones in standard Mandarin, which is what I speak in. It's the most common dialect. The first one is flat. Second one is rising. Third one is dipping. And the third one, sorry, excuse me, the fourth one is falling. So to give you an idea of what that sounds like, it would sound something like ma, 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 ma. I'll say that one more time. Ma, 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 ma. You can hear in each of those four, there's, all, there's a change in how my voice rises and falls. As you're speaking, when you're first learning Chinese, you will need to live calculate as you're talking to make sure that your tonals are correct. Uh, however, you will get to the stage where intuitive hearing follows. So in other words, um, many of the words that I know in Chinese, I actually can't tell you what the tonal is, right? I don't, I don't think, for example, I, think, I don't think of a character and I say, oh, there's fourth tonal. Oh, that's first tonal. What I think of is I just know how it sounds because I've heard the words so many hundreds of times. And you will develop an intuitive grasp of what the word is supposed to sound like. I heavily recommend to the largest extent of your ability, kind of shadowing or mirroring um, you know, a podcast or uh, a movie, even if you don't understand it very well, just sort of getting yourself used to the phoneticism of it. Uh, could you pull the slide up one more time, please? Um, now, okay, one last thing. Getting the wrong tonal can mean anything. So sometimes it will mean that people still understand you. Sometimes you'll be completely incomprehensible. And sometimes there's a couple cases where you can even insult someone by accident. <laughs> the most common one that people will point to is the term for ma and ma means respectively a mother and someone's horse. So you could call somebody's mother a horse if you use the wrong uh, tonal. But uh, I think people usually won't get mad at you for that. Next slide. Okay, so the next principle that I want to talk about is subradicals. On the right is uh, a re the most commonly, actually, it's the most complicated uh, Chinese character in all of existence. It's called biang, um, biang biang yan. This is uh, 54 strokes, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, you know, the overwhelming majority of Chinese people um, cannot write this character, even people that have lived in China their entire lives. I actually can write this character. And the reason that I can write this character is because I didn't want to learn writing at first. So what I did was I learned the hardest character. And then whenever people would ask me, can I write in Chinese, I would draw this character and they would say, oh, wow. You speak, you must write fluently Chinese. When the truth is, I probably couldn't even write my own name. <laughs> so let's take a look at this character. It's very, very overwhelming. Now, I understand that um, for most of you, you probably don't speak any Chinese, and that's okay. But I want to kind of bring your attention to something. Um, within the second, uh, the second bullet point that I have in here, notice that I write all components here either exist as their own characters or, or they have sub-radicals. So let's take a look at um, the first one that I have listed, Yan. Can you find Yan in the Biang Biang Yan character on the right? How about Chang, which is the second character? You can probably see that on the lower right and left. How about Yue, the third one? You can see that one on the left. How about the fourth one, Xin? You can see that one on the bottom. Now. Sometimes they also have what are called subradicals. So, for example, the strokes on the very top uh, is also the is also a component of an, which is what I have here on the third bullet point. That's the first character. You can see that the roof is the same. And so, what you need to do is you need to make mental associations and say, ah. That roof character, I've seen that before, and that's how you start to memorize it. In other words, you have to, as I was talking about with the web, you need to integrate how to draw these characters into wider spheres of what you already know. In fact, what I think was really cool is the Yue on the left. That's the, that's, that's the one 
the third character in the second bullet point, um, Peng Yo, that we that we learned earlier from Wo de Peng Yo. That's actually just two U.S. So as you can see, there's a really large interconnected system of Chinese characters. In other words, you're not having to start over. Uh, you're not having to individually memorize two, three, four thousand, five thousand, ten thousand characters. You can often very much rely on an already existing knowledge base, and from maybe even just something as simple as five hundred characters, and you can expand that out to. A uh, thousand, two thousand, often just using kind of recycling and reshuffling characters that you already know. Next slide. Okay, now here's my favorite example. Um, there is three characters here that you you can take a look at. Um, the three characters on the top are all pronounced Jung. So the first one is Jung, second one is Jung, and the third one is Jung. Now the crazy thing here is. They all have different meanings. So the first jump is usually associated with some kind of formal thing. So um, if somebody says jung shu kai shu, that means something has formally started. There's other meanings of jump. For example, jung zai means that something is happening right now, but we'll get to that in a minute. The second one refers to some kind of official documentation. So for example, jung ju means that you have like some uh, proof or evidence of something. And the third jung is referring to um, an illness of some kind. Uh, and now, uh, some time ago, I was talking about schizophrenia on the show. And the Chinese equivalent for schizophrenia is jingshen fenlie jung. And jingshen means like someone's vital bodily energy. Um, and then fenlie means like to separate. Right. And then Zheng is the same kind of Zheng here. It's like referring to some kind of illness. So schizophrenia in Chinese literally means energy divided illness, which I think is quite appropriate. Um, now, the thing is, and this is important to know, uh, none of these characters, if I just said Zheng to a Chinese person, they wouldn't know which, which Zheng that I was referring to, right? Because they're exactly the same. Even the tonal is the same. However, and if we could pull up the next slide, please. Um, what you can do is you can use the second character, the thing that you say next, and people will understand. So for example, as I said, zheng zai, that means something's happening right now, right? That, that means, the, so the first character you can see, zheng zai, uh, the second character, the same kind of zheng that we just talked about, that is not something you can mix with zai. And the same thing with the third one, which was talking about illnesses. Um, so when it comes to official documentation or illnesses, you can't mix these zheng zai together. And therefore, it's really important to know entire words. You don't want to know just individual character meaning. It's really important to sort of integrate these into a larger sphere of your knowledge. Next slide. OK, now this one you really want to, we're going to want to take a close look at. This is a common, uh, commonly known Chinese poem that was written uh, a couple of years ago by a uh, Chinese linguist, and um, he was a kind of a language analyst. And if you know, if you, the meaning of itself is, you know, it's talking about a uh, lion eating poet <clears throat> and how he lives in a cave. But and it's a comprehensible poem. But if you had somebody read the characters out loud. It would just sound like, as I say in the bottom, it would just sound like, and uh, I've even dared uh, or challenged uh, Chinese colleagues to read it, and they overwhelmingly couldn't. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but the reason that I have that here, right, is this is another reason why it's very important to go into characters and you can't just rely on opinion, because as it happens, Opinion will often involve sharing different characters that have the same pronunciation with different meanings. And so it's important that you know what the character is, and that's going to give you a clue as to what this is talking about. And you will get the characters with time, I promise you. It can take a long time, but you will get them. Next slide. All right. So now, now that we've talked about the principles here, how do we learn Chinese? Well, I'll tell you this. The first thing you want to do is, as we've talked about, is my dictionary app. My dictionary app recommendation is Pleco, um, P-L-E-C-O. Highly recommend. 
um, take a look at it. And what you want to do from there is just dive into any available Chinese content. So some of the uh, singers that I recommend are J Cho and um, Hu Six Six. She would call it Hu Liu Liu. Um, those are some of my favorite singers. The thing I like about songs is people tend to listen to the songs many times over, and that kind of gives you this sense of, oh, this word, I've heard this word before, right? And it gives you kind of a familiarity with it. If you want something a little bit more, uh, how would I say it? If you want something maybe a little bit more down to earth and in, in terms of how people talk, Netflix has tons of TV shows. My favorite one is The King's Avatar. Um, take a look. Even if you can't understand it, um, you, you would be surprised how much you can follow in a given TV show just by just by watching people's faces, watching what happens on the screen. Um, screenwriters know that you're supposed to show, not necessarily tell. Uh, most native Chinese content, in fact, almost all of it, has Chinese subtitles. And that's in large part because they know that it's uh, easy to sort of let a character here and there slip. Uh, and it's maybe not clear which character they're talking about. So all of it comes with uh, subtitles hard coded. Um, what I would definitely say, though, is you want to be cautious of TV dramas involving age in China. Um, these things are really cool. No question. It's kind of like getting an Eastern Lord of the Rings. Right. But you want to be cautious about that because. Many times in ancient Chinese dramas, they talk completely unrecognizable to uh, how modern people would talk. And so you don't necessarily want to spend time uh, learning how people don't talk anymore, right? You want to sort of learn how to talk to people today. And so I would definitely recommend to the largest extent of your ability, uh, watching the, as realistic TV shows as you can. So th things like family shows, um, maybe uh, Disney cartoons, if you can find them, um, you know, try to stick away from like, you know, heavy action movies or, you know, like I said, um, dramas that take place from thousands of years ago. All right, next one. And with that, I want to wish everybody um, which is what you can see on the right. Um, it, which it, it, it means wishing people happiness and prosperity in the new year. I want to wish you as well this year, happiness, prosperity. And I will also add two things in our modern day. I hope that you are able to learn Chinese successfully, at least to some extent, or any language really, but this has been Chinese focused. And I also wish you safety in this time of COVID-19. Thank you very much for tuning into China, Hawaii, and you. I'm your host, Andrew Zerman, and we will see you in two weeks.